Morning, guys. Hope you're enjoying yourself on this nice, fine Saturday quarantine morning. Uh, looks like Carl might be late, but he might not be here. It all depends. He's got uh, he's got a personal life, <laughs> which kind of sucks. Sucks for me anyway. Toronto has decided to extend our uh, stay-at-home neat lifestyle for a couple more weeks, so might accidentally become Roosh, but until then, whatever. What do we got here in the chat? I see guys. Tucson, Eric, Josephette, Ryan. Hey, that's me. The Silver Bishop. Ooh, is that like the uh, Silter, Silver Sultan? <laughs> good old Bruno. Baron, Martin. It's good to see you guys. Um, throw on a little bit of background music here to kind of keep me in a good mood for this. Future Funk. If you guys haven't heard of it, that's where vaporwave artists decide that uh interstellar 555 was the best thing coming from daft punk and they decide to ride that bitch as long as they can but either way neat little topic for you guys today yeah um how did i label it i want to go see this myself because i don't want to i don't want to get the naming wrong because i actually put a lot of effort into getting it like a little clever i guess It is. That was it. Insecurity equals gullibility. The second L is for love. Tell us about your coffee. Um, to be fair, I'm like... Alright, so here's something that uh, hipsters won't tell you. It's that being a coffee snob is actually kind of shitty. You shouldn't do it. I'm actually... I, I'll still, to this day, get comments on my channel at least one a week where somebody's like, you know, if you get a burr grinder, blah, 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 your coffee, there's your coffee, that. And I always laugh because I'm like, yeah, maybe. Um, if you guys don't know the science behind that when you make your coffee, a burr grinder, it achieves two things. One, you get a consistent grind so you don't have some smaller pieces, some bigger pieces. I use like a blender with a grinding attachment and so you will. The idea being the size of the grind means a consistent taste of coffee and it creates less heat. So like with a blender, you're actually heating up the beans as you grind them just from the friction. Supposedly that kills some flavonoids. To be honest, I've tried it. I don't see the difference, but uh, since the girl grabbed a Costco a Costco membership now, the, co the, the Costco blends are the ones we end up with, which, and this is going to be like a horrible confession to you guys, the Sumatra from Starbucks was always my go-to because I like the darker roasts. I don't want anything that's super acidic. Only because I drink so damn much of it at that point, it would end up just like killing me. Oh, look at that. Thank you, Mackin156, for the $6.99 super chat. I like that. <laughs> Smash the freaking like button. I can't argue with this guy. He knows what he's talking about. Um... Oh, yeah, so Costco. So now it's some other brand. We don't know what it is. It's also going to be a Sumatra. I like that because it's kind of got like, you know, a berry flavor to it. Like they don't burn away all of the, the coffee cherry. So... Is it 100% the perfect coffee? No. But it's 80% of the way there, and it's $1,000 less of equipment, and an hour an hour a week worth of less wasted time. And that's kind of be the theme. Why is the Illuminati in your thumbnail? Well, it's because we're getting to the topic here. And that's where this lead-in is going. Um, yeah. Insecurity is gullibility. What the hell does that even mean? Good morning, party planner. <laughs> party planner. If I didn't know any better, I'd say it's Tom Bombadil. Um, guys are gullible. Most guys are gullible. Extremely gullible. And the hipster example I gave with coffee is kind of like a, a very unharmful version of that. So, for example, some hipster tells you, oh, if you want to have the best coffee, you got to do this. You got to do this. If you're not using a burr grinder, what the hell is wrong with you? Here's the problem then. A guy will go buy a $200 burr grinder that fills up a ton of counter space. He'll get... Oh, and there's the... Uh, is there any coffee snobs in here? There's a way that the hipsters like their coffee. It's this glass thing. Looks like a potion from Legend of Zelda. And it's got a little wooden ring in the middle of it. And that's supposed to be like the big... Yeah, what's going on, Tom? And anyways, that's supposed to be like the big thing. Like if you're drinking coffee and you're not drinking like this, then, you know, whatever. The Apple iPhone of coffee. And so those cost like another hundred bucks and then you have to get special beans and <laughs> Tom, you can still call me Tom Bombadil. 
I, by the way, side note, I just think it's hilarious how you picked the name Tom Bombadil, but like, as far as I can tell, you're a fairly fire and brimstone Christian ass Christian. It's just, it's like making Harry Potter your, Potter your avatar for some Islamic form. You know what I mean? Anyways, but thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> you can call me maybe. Wine more, please. It's good to see you here too. Uh, back to the coffee uh, metaphor here. Okay, so yeah, you buy a couple hundred dollars of this, a couple hundred dollars of that. You get all these fancy things. You run through this weird process. You have like scales to weigh your coffee at the perfect gram. In other words, you've turned it into this gigantic thing where you've spent like $500 in equipment and kill like 20 minutes to make coffee. And it doesn't taste any better. I'll tell you right now, unless you're one of those super sensors and nobody is. The guys that have like 10 times the amount of taste buds in their mouth or whatever. You won't taste a difference, but because these guys convinced you you're not a real man unless you buy all these fancy coffee gimmicks, then your ego tells you how great it is. And so that's why you'll get guys telling you, oh, if you don't have a burger grinder, just go kill yourself. And you're just like, what? what the hell are you talking about? It's because their egos invest in it. And that's an insecurity of not being seen as the guy who likes it better than you. You know what I mean? And then it makes other guys gullible if you're insecure about that. And yeah, it's just coffee, but... Somebody who's insecure about not having the perfect cup of coffee can get, I want to say bullied, but. Oh, Mark Ang makes a good point too, Bombadil. Or Tommy. Wasn't included in the movie. Shame. Where would they even fit him in there? I mean, he's essentially like the Jesus figure. Or I guess he's like the Yahweh figure of Lord of the Rings. I just don't know how he'd fit it. Maybe in The Hobbit, because they liked adding filler into that. Um... I'll get to that. It's going to be a very... I'll get to your super chat here about Bukowski in a second. It's not going to be a very eloquent or, like, highbrow one. So if, if you're expecting something good here, you're going to get let down. Anyways, so that happens with sex, with marketing, with branding, with school, with everything. And so that's kind of, like, the lead into the thing here. So we'll take a break. Put that aside right now. Um, sharing my thoughts on Bukowski. So I'm not the most well-read Bukowski guy. Like I said, the only book of his I have is Woman, and um, like everybody knows that quote about just don't try. I kind of like how he has the, how best to describe this. So he has this thing where he knows what a classical man masculinity archetype is, and he finds it just like tediously boring, and he just wants to go through life as his own style of degeneracy and enjoy himself, kind of like a, a Troy Francis sort of thing there. But you also got a bit of delicious tacos in there. I just really enjoy it because he's just... While he's aware of the expectations put on him, he doesn't really live up to him. Or not even that he doesn't live up to him. He just doesn't want to. And he finds the whole thing rather drab and droll. But he doesn't do it in like a cynical, detached way. I don't know how best to describe that. I'd have to honestly put something together to be more eloquent than that. So I hope that's a good enough answer for you, Richard. Um, Brother Morpheus actually sent me a thing. He was like... I finally see in your book why you keep calling it one part Bukowski. It was actually from the chapter in when I was in Dubai and I ended up hanging out with those, are they Dutch or Finn? I think they said Dutch in there. I don't know. Something Scandinavian ish anyway, hanging out with them and basically got friend zoned, which was annoying, which was the day before I just said, ah, fuck it and go out with my buddies. And then that six foot four flight attendant story. So. Is that your theory about Tom Bombadil, by the way? The regular guy who's mastered the world around him? Because, like, everybody I've seen who knows way more about this stuff than me keeps talking about it like he's older than the trees and the rocks and the bushes and the ring doesn't affect him and he's kind of above it all, which I think that's why they say he has to be, like, above the Maiar, mostly because of that. But I kind of like your take. I would honestly prefer if he had more, like, humble origins where he's just, he's just like the Ubermensch. But that's good to know. So now we guys can know, like, the Tom Bombadil. Why somebody would use Tom Bombadil as a name. I like... Dude, I get it. This is off topic, but I love guys' pen names. Because it always lets you know so much about their mentality. It's absolutely hilarious. Like, uh, LA Confidential, Rolo Tomasi. That one there kind of lets you know where Rolo's head is at. And the fact that mine is almost just nonsensical. It was a name that my, my mom decided to give, like, a jab at my dad and spell it different. But it's just like, it's just a name that I have. It's my name, but I never use it and nobody knows it. Or uh, Rich just doesn't have time for that. Uses his full name. I don't care. 
Tom Bombadil, that one there. Who are some of the other guys that have like pen names? Hulk Hogan. I mean, he was just a giant Hulk. He was like six foot seven. So, but anyways, um, logic behind bars. Thanks again. $5 super chat. Is there ever a point in asking a girl if she's being faithful or the fact that the question comes up is the answer you need yourself to walk? Yeah, dude. All right. Um, this is something we knew from experience. Never, ever confront a girl. It's just strategic. I don't care, guys, the reason that you want to confront a girl. Those could be great, and they're usually justified, and they're rationalized to hell, and I don't give a shit. Here's what happens. If she's not cheating on you, you come across as insecure and paranoid. If she is cheating on you, she will convince you that you're coming across as insecure and paranoid. <laughs> so if you're going to get the same answer either way, just assume that's the answer. <laughs> that you're insecure and paranoid. But there's two things to this. One, uh, I don't know Rolo talks about this a lot, where there's always some instincts to, uh, like, you have an instinct that's been honed over hundreds of thousands of years to kind of tell when somebody's trying to steal the baby maker from you. And so you'll trust your instincts. But at the same time, and I agree to that to a point, but at the same time, our heads have been filled with so much nonsense growing up that... It's almost hard to trust your own instincts. Plus, but here's the way I look at it. One, clean up your own house first. Make sure that this isn't paranoia. If there's, if you're the kind of guy who got cheated on by your wife for 10 years, and now you're paranoid, everybody's cheating on you. Obviously, there's something there you need to work on. Get that shit out of the way so you're not worried about it. And I would just say get rid of the fear, uh, the fear of loss. If you're worried about losing a girl because she's cheating, then you're not ready yet to have that kind of strategy. But once you're there... Just the fact that she would make it possible for you to think that already lets you know that she's just not invested. I use Ultimate Cat, an old school one. Why more please will tell you about it here. Oh yeah, Aaron Clary's his real name. Yeah, so you kind of find <laughs> High Commander of the Hot Dude Army. Yeah, you see what I mean there? There it's kind of like a tongue-in-cheek, over-the-top 80s wrestling reference. It's kind of got the... Uh... Lost boy, frat boy vibe to it. But yeah, everybody's name always has something kind of interesting too. Um, what do you have proof? I guess confronting is a moot point then. Yeah, exactly. But we'll get to that. And I think if anything, the 2020 election should have showed you guys this. Did, was there fraud? Was there not fraud? I don't really care. Here's the point though. That, that somebody could plausibly argue that there is fraud, I think is even worse. It's called the, uh, the perception of impropriety. And for a lot of things, voting being one of them, relationships being another, not putting somebody in a position to doubt you is seen as like a mate retention behavior. Like if your girl, if your girl wants you to the exclusion of other guys, she doesn't have girl one night stands in Las Vegas or I mean girls night out in Las Vegas and shit like that. They just don't because they're into you and they know if they're into you. I mean, part of it is the fear of losing you to somebody else. So they want to keep you happy. And part of it is oh, I don't want to go out there because, you know, I'm not really looking. That's partially because if a girl is really into a guy, there's actually a fundamental physiological change they have where they actually see other men as less attractive. It's this weird, it's about as close as you're going to get to me admitting that the concept of pair bonding exists. But, and I can't remember who did the study. I'd have to go look back. I have source amnesia on it. But the idea was when a girl was happily married, happy sex life, that kind of thing, and then they were shown like a bunch of pictures of attractive men, Turns out the single girls would rate them as more attractive than the girls in relationships. With the idea there being that they physically see guys as less attractive, their emotions are their biggest aphrodisiac. And so once she's emotionally hooked on you, other people are less attractive because she doesn't have, you know, emotionally hooks on them. So if a girl is giving you an opportunity and you generally have your shit together to, to suspect something, then that right there, that's the issue to address. Not so much, is she cheating or is she not? And you don't want to make that stupid MGTOW argument that, uh, uh, you know, genetically she could be cucking and the flute flies. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fact that you even make me have to question it is the reason I'm kind of choked right here. And that's where your self-worth, your dignity, and your boundaries come into play. And that's why I keep saying they're more important than all the vetting in the world or all the shenanigans you can do about gps tracking your girl's car and any of that crap yeah it's it's just that why is somebody giving you an opportunity to doubt their sincerity in your life that's the thing to address and if it's cheating or it's not and that's just up to you 
Just don't be taken for granted. It's surprisingly simple when you look at it. Just don't be taken for granted. And the somebody who's making you even wonder if they're cheating on you is taking you for granted. Plus, you're never going to know. If a girl cheats on you, you'll never know. Girls are pretty good at hiding it. Short of you walking in the room. And like, uh, like it was mentioned up here. Well, if you have, what if you have proof? I'm like, well, it's confronting you're going to do. All it's going to do is give her an opportunity to try and gaslight you or... In the case of a separation, to get like a head start on the divorce proceedings. Like, no, man. Do what you got to do. If your wife cheated on you and you're getting ready to leave her on your timeline, don't tell her you're doing this. You never want to give, and I hate to say it this way, but it's the best way to phrase it. Don't give the enemy information. Just do your thing. She can find out when she needs the signature and her stuff's on the porch. You know what I mean? Uh, cultured manosphere over here. Cappy was practically burning novels and poetry this week. As Carl says, he's become a renaissance man. Read a few novels. Yeah, I mean, again, everything. So I don't want to say as a man, you must read novels or anything. You guys know I'm not a big fan of categorical imperatives. But uh, I'll leave this while I finish this thought. Everything builds on everything else. If you still live with your parents, moving out of your parents' house is priority number one. Maybe practicing some social skills, but you're not trying to game girls because what are you going to do? Hey, come back to my mom's place where I can bang on the wicker chair. It's a high school reference right there. <laughs> okay, I'm back to being Tom Bombadil again. It's good to see you, Tom. I like I like the name better. I like some familiarity. And Mish. Uh, yeah, so getting out of your parents' home, getting your own place, getting a place to isolate to is important. And then when you're there, building up the social skills to be able to talk your way into a girl's pants is important. Being attractive is important. Psychologically. And then, you know, as you move forward to get into more into like if or when you want a relationship, then you have to get to the point where psychologically you're more stable more assured sense of self, the ability to hold boundaries, that sort of thing. And then at that point, once you got that stuff down, okay, maybe maximizing, making your fortune, but everything kind of builds on itself. And I'd say once you got the obvious stuff down, then, you know, oh, hey, Johnny Bravo, it's good to see you, man. Oh, good for you, though. <laughs> if you got a new girl every week, your mom's going to know how really alpha you are. Yeah, take that, mom. Dude, I think I did it once. Once when I was a kid, I brought a girl home to my place. We weren't even smashing. I think we were like 15 or something like that. So we we're just making out a bit. And I remember she would just like open the door, ask me some nonsense question about some shit she's never asked me before. And then as she left, she would just leave the door open and then just wander by the room glaring at me every like three minutes. And I was like, what in the hell is wrong with this woman? Yeah, women are all bitches. And I was like, all right, fair enough. <laughs> But yeah, I think reading fills up a void in that one. And I was, as a kid, I never read a lot anyway. So I can't be telling guys, hey, guys, in your 20s, you need to read a novel a week. Because I never did that. And pretty much every book until I was 28. Well, after the age of 16, until the age of like 28, 29, every book I read was either a technical manual or a school textbook. So, or an operational order, messages. So I don't know how important it is. I will say this, though. There's something about... I did go to museums, and I will say there's nothing wrong with getting a little bit of culture in your life just to round out the dimensions of your personality. Like, I think, guys, sailor story. You guys are going to love this one. Um, so whenever we went to foreign ports when I was sailing, most people did the same thing. Friday night, you go to the bar that's closest to the ship. You get drunk around all your sailor friends. You get into trouble. One or two people are going to get charged for doing something they shouldn't have done. And then they spend all a Saturday hungover on board. They get out for a couple hours, but then they have to come back to ship because it's 630 in the morning to do a watch turnover and have to do a duty watch on Sunday. If you're lucky, you paid somebody $200 to take your shift and then you can go out in the world and like spend a day. So we decided not to do that. Um, Friday, we're like, you know what? Friday, normal day, just some tourist stuff, grab some dinner. And then we jag it in early. So we don't ever have to become a witness in a summary trial and lose a whole day to, to a testimony. And... The next whole Saturday, we got the entire Saturday to day drink and have fun and do whatever. And then Sunday too. Because, you know, so it's, it, you generally get to enjoy more of the countries you've been to. Now, here's where the story gets funny. My thing was always like going to museums. I'm a huge art snob. Well, I used to be a huge art snob, but I, I'm art in the same way that I'm coffee. I don't have a bird grinder. And uh, so I go down there. I took my buddies and we're like, yeah, dude, we're in. And I can't remember where we were at the time. But it was one of the places with a bigger... Like, it would have been, like, the, the Met in New York, but it was somewhere on the West Coast or in 
Europe. I just wish I could remember off the top of my head now. I did it to a bunch of countries, but the specific one I'm trying to remember is because I walked through and the guys just wanted to kill some time because the bars weren't opening till 11. And they called me gay for like three hours going through the museum. And I talk about, oh, you know, one art movement here. That's why this is Baroque. This is Renaissance. And, you know, this is why modern art is the way it is. And this is the purpose of the, the Jasper Johns painting the American flag upside down and whatever. So they called me gay for like four hours. And then at the bar all night, they called me gay. And then we go home. And it's funny because I found it out from their girlfriends later on, who's now, one is the wife, one's gone. But, and she's like, oh yeah, they were telling me about it. Like the boys went down, you guys went down to the museum and they were so cultured and they felt like they were just, and they were just talking about how cultured and wonderful they were and their highbrow interests. And I'm like, those cocksuckers called me, <laughs> called me a closet homosexual for seven hours. <laughs> and then they come home and they talk to their girl like they just... Like they just painted something in the Louvre, but it was actually pretty good. I ran it. I did that for game too, where for like, if I had a day date, just take her to a museum and it gave me a good conversation. Cause we could talk about the pieces and it was always like, everything is a story. I could talk about art and if you guys want to, I will, but it's kind of off topic, but it's amazing. You can tell art in the storytelling sense and almost it's like visual philosophy too. So you can talk about it forever and people always find it interesting because a, no girl knows fuck all about art, except for nerdy art girls, and I wasn't dating them anyway. And B, it gives you guys something to do that's not being overtly sexual. And then you can guide her through the museum, you know, touch the small of the back. It was actually pretty cool. But there's nothing wrong with, like, reading books or going to a museum or doing a lot of that nerdy stuff. It can be a part of your game that makes you better. Because most guys are like, I don't know what to do. We'll just take her to Starbucks and then go to a pub and then smash. And I'm like, eh. I guess you could do that, but everybody's doing that. But being able to do something different just helps you round out your skill sets. Uh, so Johnny Bravo, been on a walking date yesterday. It was cold and I was sniffling nose all the time and I had a massive migraine. I didn't kiss her. Good choice or ABC. If you're not feeling it, you're not feeling it, man. Um, Carl actually brings this story up and I can't remember. I want to say it's not Tom Toreo, but I'm going to say Tom Toreo where he did the one where he went to go get some cold medicine from the pharmacy because he was feeling sick as shit. And they walked past a girl that he's like, oh man, that girl's gorgeous. And then he did literally like, look, I feel like shit. I'm in my jogging pants, but I would have killed myself if I didn't come and get a number and talk to you later when I'm feeling better. You can just be honest with that. Like, dude, I like you. I came out because I wanted to, I wanted to see if you were, you know, worth my time or whatever you want to word it with. But yeah, I'm just so sick as shit and I got a hot giant headache. So... <laughs> We're going to have to be friends at the end of this date, but I promise, I promise I'll hit on you next time. It's like, whatever, just roll with it. As long as you don't take things seriously, nobody else takes things seriously. <laughs> you son of a bitch. Um, this one here. Have you guys seen season two of the Soya Sphere drama? Oh, we'll get to that. Anyways, this, so back on topic, the insecurity and the gullibility. So I use the coffee reference. I use the sailor reference. Now I'm going to say how this talks about sexual strategy. Um, a lot of guys are insecure about their masculinity, mostly because they actually have the, the, the benefit of being able to consider their masculinity. I always argue guys in the fifties were too busy, you know, protecting from the communists to think about that. And, uh, guys before that were so busy, you know, farming and not starving to death and not freezing to death and surviving the famine that they didn't have time to think about masculinity either. They were just too busy getting shit done. But now we're at a point where we're all surviving. Uh, we're all surviving. We're all doing fine. You could basically screw up your whole life and still carve a living out of it. And so everybody has to sit here and navel gaze about, well, what makes me a man? My, my aunts, and they pick like random shit from the ancestors, you know? Well, cavemen were men because they had rites of passage. And then when they were included on the first hunt, that was the, the demarcation line where they became a man. They got their they got their sheepskin and their robe and they threw their hats in the air and they survived man university. Or the Spartans would throw toddlers out with a spear and a cape. It's like, don't come back without a wolf's head. And, you know, five of them did and ten of them didn't. And that was real men. And it's like, no, they're just picking random shit from the past. It's like saying... Until, you, until you've boarded your first pirate ship, you're not a real man. It's like, come on, dudes. Until you've wrestled your first cow to the ground in branding season, you're not a man. Just pick, And they become more nonsensical as, as people go on because it's typical of guys 
you brag about, oh, I've read this book. And then the guy who has to be one up on you is like, oh, well, I wrote that book. And you're like, oh, well, I've, I invented books. And you're just like, oh, for fuck's sake, guys. But that's kind of how this insecurity, and it all starts from the same base insecurity, is everybody's concerned about having purpose in their life. And they don't understand how arbitrary that is. Yeah, it was easier when everybody was a sustenance farmer because not starving to death and not letting your kids starve to death was purpose because it was like there and it was tangible. And if you screwed it up, you knew. So yeah, they in, in a sense, they had it easier. But in a more true sense, we have it easier in that I don't have arthritis and die at the age of 45 of a fucking heart attack, you know? And then Tommy here, my Catholic godmother didn't like Tom Bombadil because she knew it was my red pill pen name. She wanted me to be Florida Catholic party planner was a compromise i had to cut her off she tried to cook. <laughs> i don't know calling you florida man probably be worse i thought everybody would rather yeah florida man or tom bombadil well florida man's doing meth so i'd rather at least you were blasphemous than you were like killing yourself <laughs> you tried to cut me surprised your grandma knows about any of this stuff i don't know it's i guess it just must be nice to have a grandma of mine that mine passed away years ago both of them or all four of them. Actually, I think. Yeah, the mom's side, dad's. Oh, that's right. My mom. Okay, all three sets of grandparents. Yeah, is that when the cavemen had their bar mitzvah? See, Marty's catching on. Yeah, just keep this little bit of a reference. Have some fun. Uh, all the snow we had here just got me back into photography. Art is just fun. Yeah, see? Baron's getting it too. Photography is one of those things. Like I studied it a bit in college. I was never the best at it, but luckily enough with digital technology, the way cameras are right now, I don't have to be like just the simple rule of knowing that your aperture and your F-stop go up as the other one goes down in perfect synchronicity. Like I don't have to know that anymore. I just look at the histogram and then adjust it accordingly, which is kind of nice. But that's the thing. Girls love that kind of novelty. And as a guy, it gives you something to do. It's literally... Um, I need to stop at my place to go feed my fish. You know, that old classic pickup thing where you give a girl a reason to come over to your house. So they're already, so you've already built up the plausible deniability and you cut off any anti-slut defense early on so that later on in the night, yeah, we'll go back to my place. And she's like, oh yeah, I've already been there before. Like, we've, I've been to his place a few times already. We've been on three dates. Never mind that they were within 10 minutes of each other. But now you guys built up this repertoire, this history and this way in her head to justify it. Well, I'm not a slut. We just went out a couple times, had a couple dates. I've been to his place once or twice, and yeah, of course we can go out and have a date. That was the one thing I liked about uh, Goldman's thing, is that he was big in photography game. Of course, then he started getting big into into the into the devil's cabbage, or devil's lettuce. Now I just don't know. Don't trust that man. And then we got Vincent here. Tom, by the way, Tom, <laughs> I keep telling this man, but it's funny. When I first knew about Tom Bombadil, he was like... You're, he was like the epitome of the guys who would like rant about Rolo Tomasi inside of his Honda Civic thing. And to watch in the past like year, his complete transformation into Super Chad has been just a thing, a thing of amazement, like absolutely heartwarming. But yeah, an acquired taste. <laughs> uh, and then Vincent here. I remember a guy on YouTube who was really insecure about his masculinity. Anthony something. Can't remember. Wasn't a memorable guy. <laughs> I like that. Oh, and that was the thing from before. <laughs> but there's this giant insecurity about guys worried about their purpose in life and that because nobody gave it to them, not realizing that the only reason our grandfathers and great grandfathers and fathers were ever given anything is because somebody needed them. Turns out the biggest driver of productivity was male sexuality until like 50, 60, 70 years ago. What do I mean by that? That just means that's why the Catholic Church was so powerful. Because they're like, all right, this uh, this soft harem with a warlord thing, hiring a bunch of dudes to go slay an entire population and then, you know, pillage and take the women of that town. It's not very sustainable. We keep losing a lot of guys and those guys could have been spent farming. So like, here's the deal. Uh, God says you only get one chick and you got to love her forever. And don't you dare stray and don't cheat on her. And you keep it between your knees and you save it till marriage. And then we'll promise you eternal life. And everybody's like, oh, wow, that's pretty good. That's much better than uh, than slaughtering a town and hopefully getting one girl to sleep with me. <laughs> Through struggle hugging means. 
And then the Christianity decided that was great. And as long as they kept a gatekeeper on male sexuality, they, guys would just, dude, guys did the crusades, guys tilled the fields, guys made art. Even the gay guys, like, what was it? What was his name? Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos used to say, like, he thinks that uh, gay is going to be wiped out of the gene pool in a couple generations because even back in the day, you had to be closeted and they would still pick up wives and have kids and separate, you know, spread gay genes throughout, which, whatever. I don't know if it's true, but it was a very funny story. But now that nobody has to keep up appearances, I don't know, it makes a good case for it. But here's, here's the point. Um... Now, with the advent of oil and the combustion engine and the industrial revolution and the information age, productivity is completely detached from male pro from like a strong back and a, and a good forearm. So now that productivity and labor are completely detached, guys have kind of lost their one historical means of, uh, of productivity. And that creates a giant looming existential insecurity among men. To which I would argue, awesome. It's the most freeing thing ever. Like, imagine... Uh, being the first guy who didn't have to do one specific thing. You have the freedom to do whatever. And I think that's scary for a lot of guys. That's why they keep trying to get back on the plantation. And they ask like, oh, dude, now that I don't have to do this stuff, I need somebody to tell me that I have to do this stuff so I can be comfortable in knowing I'm doing the right thing. And I'm like, dude, do you want to know what modern masculinity is? Just pick a spot, go plop yourself down there and dare somebody to move you. It's basically it. And yeah, a lot of people call it nihilism, but you know what? Nihilism is embracing the fact that all of our all of our gods are dead and we can go carve our own path. We become our own gods. What do you what do you fill that space with? Isn't that the Nietzschean thing? God is dead. What do you fill the void with? You either got that or social justice warriors and woke culture, so it's up to you. What's that old Adam Carrillo bit? Germany or Florida? That's funny. And I guess, and so that's, that's the, that's the part of it. So what is it? All right. Well, what are the things that guys can do that girls can't? It's not much. Like I said, labor and productivity are detached. So you can say like, yeah, I can move hay bales all day or some shit like that. It's like, yeah, but girls can run a tractor and do the same thing. That was actually a story we, we had in the military where they were talking about, uh, jeez, oh, I wish I could remember the whole detail. I'll get the broad strokes right anyway, but it was. There was the task where one general decided to show off to the other general how um, guys, like girls, don't belong in the military. It was like a basic training story. And then they had the guys take these big jugs of water, they move it from one truck, unload it onto the thing, load it onto another truck. And they were sitting there hauling things, lifting it, moving it over, and they're like, see, this is just no way girls could do this. And then the story went that the girl would just look over at that thing, she went and grabbed a forklift, drove it back, picked it up, put it on the other thing, and they go, there, done. It was done faster and more efficiently. I think the idea there was to um, justify females in the forces, which, whatever. Have an opinion of whatever you want about that. I just know, because 1995 was when the Navy had first added, like, put women on the ships. And so it was the first, like, real integration of the Navy. And I had only joined in 2003, so it only had been, like, seven, eight years. So they were still at that point where they kind of had to, like, justify it to the troops. This, though, not entirely true because female roller derby has been like an amazing sport for the longest time. And it's super fun to watch if you guys haven't watched it. And if you make it think like, oh, it's just a bunch of chicks, whatever. It's like, no, they're they're brutal. They will like body check chicks over the rails and a gut to the stomach. It's pretty fun stuff to watch. To... Yeah, Satan is active these days. Look at the Jesuit Satan. I don't know. To be honest, if you're going to talk about the evil of, like, Catholic sinners, don't you think there's a much more relevant and uh, systemic <laughs> avenue you could take that? How about the fact that, like, there was a pedophile ring amongst the Catholic Church for, I don't know, 150 years? You want to go with that, or you just want to go with Pope Francis is saying something about feminism? I'm just saying, man. <laughs> I'm just saying. Or the ones that sided with the German-Austrian painter scene in the 1940s. Catholic Church has never been a good boy organization, so I don't know. Like, whatever. I'm not trashing your religion. I'm just, like, you, you, you don't bullshit me, man. <laughs> don't piss on me and tell me it's raining. Uh, oh, wait. And then, Ryan, you were talking about people using wrist reading in game, niche psychology angle. Can you go on that, some detail about that? Maybe later. If you really, really want to ask me later, and we'll see about going into that. 
but we're ticking into the insecurity and gullibility thing. So here's the thing. That insecurity guys have, and it, most guys have it, at least younger guys. Once a guy gets older, he's like, yeah, I'm too busy. I don't have time for it. And then, you know, if he's a little too bored, he might navel gaze about his purpose on earth. But I'd argue it's pretty much wasted effort because sometimes it really is just as simple as like make money, lift, have muscles, learn a bit of game, enjoy your life in the ways that you want to enjoy it. Build a church if you want to leave a lasting impact or have a statue. Build a cabin. Um, where's I going with this one? Oh yeah, so that's the point, is that that creates a gullibility because people now realize there's the two biggest motivators for marketing are fear and greed. Fear and greed. Fear of missing out, greed, everything. Stock market bubbles are based on greed and fear. Um, fear and greed builds grifts, fear and greed builds giant agencies, fear and greed drive action. If you don't believe me, fear is what drove the fear about terrorism and completely the de complete degradation of our rights in the 2000s. I would argue fear is also doing that with COVID right now. It's not proportional to the actual danger. We all can admit that. Um, Greed was what made like the dot com bubble happen. Everybody thought they were going to make money. Same thing as like the housing crisis of 2008. Everybody's like, oh, this is going to go up forever. And now with Bitcoin, I'd argue, and this is going to really go against the grain. And yes, I'm an uninformed, like I know the mathematics behind Bitcoin. I get the cryptography. I get that part. I don't watch the markets and I don't understand the trends to follow, but I do understand people and I'm at least smart enough to understand trends. And I'll tell you right now, I don't know when it's going to pop. I don't know where it's going to pop. And I don't know how big it is. But there is a crypto bubble right now. Because once you see like room temperature IQ people talking about it going up forever till the end of time, you're already in it. Like I guarantee it. And I'm staying in the game now. I got as of today, I think. Actually, let me check this. I might actually finally own crypto. But because it's not as fast as cash with the velocity, I got to wait like two weeks to find out if I actually did buy it. Oh, wait. Um... Do I own crypto yet? Not yet. <laughs> not yet. All right, we'll get there. But I put 10,000 in on crypto. 10,000 Ethereum, 10,000 uh, Bitcoin. Only because, and this is a shout out to um, Charlie from Crypto and Rule Zero Dad. They suggested Celsius Network. So while I don't like the idea of betting on crypto, going up, doubling my money and all that shit, I do like their model where it was just, they lent, they're just doing typical, it's like a what used to be a uh, credit union. So if you guys know your bank account gives you like 0.1% interest, doesn't even keep up with inflation. It's absolutely ridiculous. But what these guys do, because they're small and they're startup and they're banking there, they got the same banking regulations that European banks have. And they loan your crypto out to other people and they take back at like a good interest rate. I think it's like 24% or some craziness there. But the thing is they pay like 80% of that back to you as a dividend. And I'm like, that's perfect. Crypto is a dividend fund based on a... Uh, based on a credit uh credit union i'm like i can live with that so that's good so now it's gonna get i don't know from what it looks like 10 11 percent a year interest and i'm like that's fine leave it there and if it goes up it goes up if it goes down it goes down but just long term don't look at it for like 15 years and then when it's done we'll find out where it is worst case scenario if i lose that money i lose it i've made more than that off of standard investing anyway so but Back to greed and fear. That's the point. Greed and fear kind of drive these decisions. And if you want to be good in investing at all, you can't have either. You can't be greedy and you can't be fearful. Greedy people hold on to stocks too long and they lose the they lose the the upward trend because they want to get that last penny out of it and then they miss it and then they have to catch the falling knife to cut their losses. Fearful people sell it as soon as the stock dips a little bit, even though if it goes up right after. But if you just Pay attention to his, like where you see the, the ceiling and the floor set up and you kind of time it good enough and make yourself an exit point. You generally do better over the long term. And again, this 
And I know it's like, what does this have to do with masculinity and sleeping with chicks? And I'm like, it kind of has everything to do with it because... Like, girls get very emotional about this stuff, and God bless them for that. If they didn't do that, they wouldn't have what made them as women. I don't know why everybody's like, I want a woman who's not emotional. I'm like, do you want one with a dick, too, while you're at it? Like, why are you wasting my time? Yeah, and this here. And don't get me wrong. For a lot of guys, too, like, if crypto's the only money you're making, then you're pretty much screwed because you didn't diversify because you caught on to greed, but... I mean, I got a book, an audio book, a YouTube channel, a Patreon. Like, there's eight, 18 different things that I can invest in right now. The regular stock market, RRSPs, TFSAs, this one here. Between all of them, any one of them can fail, and it'll suck. But I won't go out of business. I won't starve in the street. And that's kind of the point. Crypto is just one more income stream out of another, out of all of them, right? yeah and it's just you're being possessive johnny it's that caveman dna in you that's all this is just more aloof you can't own girls and that's fine you can't tell them what to do it's fine too the only power you have as a guy is your feet and that's something if guys embrace that to the level that they should and i, I don't use should very often this is one of the few times i say should embracing your ability to walk away as your one superpower as a man opens the world to you because that's really when you talk about power and freedom from a guy's perspective that's what you mean freedom the freedom to be able to do what i want without somebody stopping me that's essentially it and being able to walk away is the best way to manifest it i'd argue but yeah the reason you're attached to that is because you're attached and you instinctively you see it as some kind of like sexual threat even though your frontal lobe is like no nah, man it's a butch lesbian who cares but same thing yeah like the Mish says she's not yours oh oh geez so below the belt Corey. so below the belt having said that i think that's probably my second favorite take from you my favorite one being your one on steven pinker the only scientist i've ever known who's ignored the results of his own studies but, oh, okay, so back to the gullibility thing. So now, you know about fear, you know about greed, you know about how guys invest in things with their ego, you know there's this raging insecurity about your purpose in life because, and it sees how it manifests. You see the trad side where it's like, okay, the one thing that guys can do that girls can't is knock up chicks. So knocking up chicks and making as many babies as possible and working hard on, you know, my carpentry, <laughs> my carpentry profession is going to be what makes me a man. They literally take like a snippet of what used to make men. Some arbitrary one. Some guys, and they call this like the hyper-masculinity, like thug culture, where a lot of guys have to act like raging hard-ons for violence. Disrespect is like the worst thing ever. That's where you get stories of guys getting shot in movie theaters because somebody steps on their pumas. Or uh, constantly starting fights with anybody because they're looking at them sideways and shit like that. So they, they don't know what makes masculine men masculine as well so they just take okay so what do we have testosterone and aggression and they just run with that and that's like there so the trads are like yeah semen is what we got and then these ones are like violence is what we got and then other guys are like sleeping with girls because we can sleep with chicks chicks can't sleep with chicks and so they go pick up and this is it being a complete degenerate is the only way to do it kind of like unironic like troy talks about that more as like a literary term but some people unironically are just like yep if i don't if I don't get buried with like two girls giving me a hand job, then what's the point? And Eric's got a good point. They can't even spell respect. That's the thing. It's not respect that they're after. They just wanted to be treated nicely and placated. A girl white could pat you on the head and you're such a good boy. And all the guys are like, man, you're just fucking awesome. And as soon as you stop feeding that, uh, that illusion, that's when they start treating it as disrespect. Feed me my narrative. Um, what are some other examples we can think of here? Some guys treat it as the work. Well, only a guy can survive in the business world. And they treat making money as their one thing. And But you see what I mean, though? Every guy just takes, what did men do in the past? And then they pick a small sliver of that. And then they just dial that tism up to 12. And that's what you end up with. And I would argue, and, and I, I guess to some extent, I do that too. Because I like the idea of the Renaissance man. The guy who has interest in multiple things. And to take that well-rounded holistic type uh, approach and then just dial that up to 12. I'll say I'll say I have I pick different but then everybody is saying that they pick the right one is different. My god's better than your god, you know, that shit. But 
ultimately you get to pick. And I think that's the point that people miss because everybody's so busy telling everybody you have to pick theirs. They're like, no, it's just, just your freedom of choice is something you get right now. And does that make you like a classic man? Probably not. But at the same time, like, well, the modern world is not going to let you be a classic man anyway, because the things that existed for classical men to be classical men just isn't there anymore. You don't have to fight a wolf. You don't have to attack a bear. You don't have to be a sustenance farmer. If you want to work on the oil rigs, you have to go there and volunteer. Like the military, there's no conscription anymore. If you want to go to war, you have to sign up. And even then, they may not take you because you're too fat. Pentagon's already working on drones because they realized, all right, Americans are too fat to fight in a war. So uh, we'll just put them behind a console, have them play Doom and Quake, and then let them be drone warfare for a while. Even that didn't work. They figured out, okay, so it turns out you can't have a guy control a drone and then go home and eat dinner with his family. It fucks with his head. So they actually have to they actually have to fly a guy to the green zone in a war zone to do drone warfare there because otherwise his brain can't handle the complete juxtaposition of warfare on one side and then like a nice quiet family dinner on the other. So you have to put them into a war situation so they don't snap. That's another one. See, oh dude, Speaking of reading, makes a full-grown man. Um, I still have to finish Rich's book, the alpha there. And I actually want to read Troy's book. It's a smaller read, which is fine. And then Don Quixote, or Quixote, or I don't even know how to pronounce it. Corey's got me on that, and I've got to read that. And then uh, Clary's book, the of Numbers, i got to read that one. There's so many things backed up here. So that's why my goal lately has been to, like, pre-record as many episodes of the shows as I can so I can just sit back for like a week and just read books like how nerdy is that um yeah anyways we're uh, back off topic no reason to talk about the brand shit it's like airline food conversations here but yeah Quixote okay Ki Quixote alright Benji Chesty you guys argue with it Kato I'll call him Keto. Don Keto. <laughs> um, about how many hours do you read a day? Not as many as you'd think. Like, I'm... But that's the thing. I don't... I read. But a lot of the time, the stuff I read is the stuff I've already written. So, like, I write at least an hour a day. Whether it's a YouTube script, a blog post, part of the book. And I read that. <laughs> but I don't have a lot of time to read other people's stuff. Uh, I guess, oh, what the hey, you know what? Who wants to do some red meat? Do you guys want to do some red meat? Do you guys want to do some drama, some shit posting, some talking smack, some unity of the manosphere? Let me know in the chat. F's in the chat if you want to see, or D's in the chat if you want to see some drama. Till then, we'll still talk about some like actionable advice. Uh, young guys though, and here's the thing is, this is kind of annoying in the sense that guys don't have mentors anymore. Like the fact that military actually had to train us on how to do mentorship. All right, I'll finish the mentor shit and it looks like we're doing the drama. <laughs> 60% content, 40% drama. That's the good combination there. Uh, yeah, mentorship. They actually had to teach us that, which is very strange. So guys don't get that anymore. And it's something I've kind of known. I use it as like my, it's almost like a script at this point because I've, repeated it so much but i'm sure you guys have heard it before i'm gonna say it again screw it odds are there's somebody new here as a kid it used to be there would be all kinds of male influence at very different stop gates of your life to help you out with the little things at first it was dad dad was around when mom was super emotional and wanted to coddle you to dad be like oh let him stick his finger in the light socket whatever ah uh, he could be fine he can cry it out and then he kind of then the kid kind of learned that just because the parents weren't constantly coddling him wasn't taken as a, as a thing of rejection. They gave him some structure in life. And so that's gone because a lot of moms, and it's the weirdest thing, most, <laughs> most, uh, oh, Tom, <laughs> Tom's giving me the D. You know what that means? It means like, it means I got to give you the money shot. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's gone because and it's every guy I've ever talked to who's been the kid of a divorced parents. The kid was always five. Like I was, when I was divorced, when my, when my parents were divorced, I was five. Like in the chat here for a lot of you guys. And Corey, don't get in with your spiel. I know your story, so don't mope out the chat with that one. But 
How old were you when your parents got divorced? I'd, I'd argue most of you guys are between the ages of three and seven, most likely around five. It's just one of those things. I've kind of wrapped a narrative around it as a theory, but whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it covers it well enough. It's just that the age of five is when kids start school and then having a father isn't essential, but it's nice to have. And so if that attraction isn't there and the only thing is there is somewhat equal parenting strategies, it's not going to last. So dad's no longer around the house. Teachers at school are no longer around because they kept accusing male teachers of elementary kids to be in pedophiles, even though when you check the news now, it's just chicks diddling kids now. So kids no longer had guys teaching them in elementary school. The gruff PE teacher is no longer a thing. And in high school, they've kind of gone off of it. It's at the point now where a guy may not see a guy in his life until his 20s. And you can't tell me that that doesn't have an effect on a kid's formative years when his entire childhood is spent only around chicks. If you don't believe me, just just talk to a guy who's got five sisters versus a guy who had only brothers. Like, I got three sisters, and even I see the difference. <laughs> My parents were 52 when they separated. Yeah, 10, 12, 2, 4. But see, it's weird. There's like two different groups here. The first ones are kids around the ages of five, and the second one is kids closer to like middle teenage years. Now I don't have a I don't have a theory yet for the teenage year one because we haven't had enough field reports on it, and enough stories, and enough things to base it on. But it's just one of those things you'll start to see a pattern there. Yeah. Anyway, so back to the drama. Um, I'm gonna thank Corey for this one. Sent me a link. Absolutely wonderful. It's like, dude, you got to see this. I guess. Uh, I guess there's a couple brands in the Manosphere who now want the Manosphere to all get along and practice unity, which I thought was absolutely wonderful three years ago when I suggested, and then everybody decided to lose their fucking mind. So, you know, whatever. Burn in hell. <laughs> Let them burn. Um, I actually remember Tanner and I talked about this in 2018, where he couldn't figure it out back then either. It's like, why is it the sphere is all about helping men, but not a single one of these guys can get along? And I'm like, well... To be fair, you're telling a bunch of codependent dudes that they need to become, to gain a healthy level of narcissism, start acting in their own best interest, be more aloof, Machiavellian, you know, a little bit of a bad boy. And we're telling guys to do this, complete independence and act like your own man and be charming, but get along like everybody else as if you were a bunch of chicks. It's like, it's kind of an unrealistic expectation. He goes, yeah, it's a fair point. <laughs> Which, and it's great too, because like, you'll see this, Tanner. Obviously, I'm not a Mormon. I'm pretty anti-religious as far as things go, but like I'll never talk shit about Tanner other than the occasional poking of fun, but I do that with everybody because he generally like lives lives life the way he wants to. He decided he wasn't very good at being violent, so he went and did boxing, got knocked out. He's like, yeah, I learned something, and now my kids know I'm not a pussy. I'm like, can't fault a guy for that. Set his mind to doing something, did it. Didn't know how to work with his hands, so he learned how to build build the house from scratch or, you know, build carpentry and stuff like that. He realized he was too skinny, not in shape, so, you know, got bulked, started doing triathlons. I'm like, D you can say anything you want about Tradcon LARPers. If they were all like Tanner, though, I think the world would be a better place, so I'll never say a bad word about him. But that's the thing. I know on a fundamental level, we can't, like, do the... Do the Mormon Christopher Hitchens podcast where we just talk about, he talks about how great religion is and I talk about how it's dumb. Like, it's not going to work. So you can't really expect guys to get along. Uh, it's very hard to unplug when you had a narcissistic father who broke an alpha mother. I don't know what an alpha mother is, but I, I see your story. Your story about your stepdad giving her ashes. My story too. Yep. Work like a charm. Not going to lie. My brother ended up having to step in after and did some legal stuff to help her out, so that was pretty good. I know, to be fair, I'm all for chicks getting nothing in a divorce, but in that case, it was 20 years and three kids in. It's like, I don't know, she paid dues, man. She's old school that way. Although, she has divorced twice, so how old school schools can she be? Whatever. <laughs> yeah, don't bring up the old memories there, Marty. Uh, so who is it? It was the it was Johnny and Donnie. The Johnny and Donnie, let's get along happy hour. Why can't everybody just get along? Uh, luckily, I get I don't get involved much in these ones because I'm not a big enough brand to be called out directly, which is almost like a blessing. So I want to thank you guys for only having 13,000 of you subscribe. So that way, 
every time somebody wants to start talking shit to make a brand, they won't talk about me. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's just so weird because it's like, you can't do that. Like, actually, you know what? Back this up. I'm sure you guys know the red pill thing. Ignore what she says. Watch what she does. Everybody knows that. Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. It's taking the the sexual strategy that women have, the innate or the uh, commitment skepticism bias. And I always call that the innate skepticism bias, and I shouldn't. It's the commitment skepticism bias, where girls are hardwired to distrust cheap signals of fidelity. That's why if you tell a girl you love her, she'll call you an idiot. You buy her a ring, but she knows she's got to go down. Uh... So that's a that's one of the the red pilled strategies where we take a female strategy and adopt it to male sensibilities. There's other ones, dread, perfect example of a female branch swing with male sensibilities. The idea of dark triad game is just essentially telling a 35 year old man to act like a 22 year old chick with big tits. That aloofness, that disregard, that charmingness, the playfulness, all that stuff. These are all basically female strategies adopted to male sensibilities. We see chicks doing something; it works really well. Like Japan, hey, let's make that add an, <laughs> add an autistic level of perfectionism to it and then see what we can do with it. And bam, here we are. Uh, so in this case, ignore what she says, watch what she does. And then you got to ask, like, watch what she does. John and Rolo and Rich and Troy and all those guys have kind of given me like an intimate knowledge of this nonsense. And I'm just amazed. You'll see a guy for a year try to get a, like to get Rolo's attention basically by calling him an asshole. Calling him an asshole. Throwing pictures of his kids and his wife and trying to call him by his like try to dox him and shit like that. Which first off is funny. Like I, I don't like that. For the sense that I think people should be allowed to have their privacy. But at the same time, doxing usually works because guys were insecure. And so they they hid behind like a, a false bravado veneer. It's like, uh, who was the other examples? A limitable man is like the king of dark triad. But then when Tate doxed him by showing his online girlfriend calling him a simp, then everybody's like, oh my god, the doxing, it's horrible. Or uh, Robert Fisher, the creator of the Red Pilled subreddit got doxxed by an article on the Daily Beast where they showed he was just basically a fat guy with nerdy hobbies. Didn't look very attractive. And that was it. That doxing him. Oh my God, the king of the red pill, the all nine He-Man woman hater space is actually just a big fat nerd. And everybody's like, oh my God. Roosh, same thing. They didn't really dox him because everybody knows who he is. But that photo they took of him outside of his parents' flat in, I think it was London or somewhere, or DC, in like jogging pants and a t-shirt with like a gravy stain on it and they're like there oh my god it turns out that this master pickup the godfather of game is actually just some like slovenly basement dweller oh my god but i always laugh because when they try to dox rollo they're like oh my god the guy who says he does stuff does exactly what he does <laughs> the guy who's been married for 20 years still has a wife after 23 years and she's not a physical ham beast and oh my god he's got well-adjusted kid and you're like oh so like that stuff there. So I don't like that attack in his privacy thing. But then is it any wonder that uh, like there's certain people that just won't work with other people? Oh, we just need to let bygones be bygones. I'm like, who here in the chat's a father? If somebody if somebody harassed your kid, what are the odds you'd be able to tell them? Oh, okay, yeah, sure, man. Let's do a collaboration next week. Probably zero, right? So it's just the tone deafness of it. I don't get it. Plus, it's not really setting a good example. But here's the thing. And I'm not shitting on Donnie or John Somnes here. They're trying their best, assuming good intentions, whatever. But uh, whenever somebody tells me we need to be better men, I instantly have my suspicions up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a whole other topic there. To be fair, he docks his back. Like, I know what that, uh, what's that dude? That tomato guy, the Ragnaroth or whatever. That guy was harassing his mom and he just did that as return. I don't know. Yeah. I play stupid games, win stupid prizes. I don't know what to say on this. The whole drama nonsense, I don't like it. In fact, I'm kind of embarrassed even bringing it up now, but whatever. It, it's here. It happened. <laughs> I'm adding to the problem, not part of the solution. 
But you guys put D's in the chat. My hands are tied. <laughs> oh, yeah. Doxing in the 70s and 80s was called a phone book. But that's the thing. But it's good, though, as a strategy for guys. If you're if you're if doxing is a real concern, well, there's a real easy solution to it. Don't lie on the Internet. Don't be insecure about stuff before you go on the Internet. Like right now, I'll tell you right now, if you guys, if somebody happens to, and I'm, I'll be amazed if they do, they'll have to be some kind of NSA level shit. If they manage to dox Carl, all they're going to find is Carl was like underselling his skills and his talent and what he's accomplished. And it'll be absolutely amazing. And I think those would be the funniest doxings where it's like you dox a guy and they're like, actually, he's pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Um. So what's the point of all this? Guys aren't meant to collaborate. We don't form cartels. That's just not how guys are wired, at least not really good men. Ideally, if you want guys to work together, you just have to make it appeal to their self-interest, not their not their better nature. Which is weird, because if you're hearing that from red-pilled brands, and they haven't even read the fucking 48 Laws of Power, then I don't know what to tell you. In fact, that's probably a good lesson for everybody. Now, I'll tell you the story about Scotty. Scotty was a guy I used to sail with. Kind of reminded me of, if you guys ever watched the Trailer Park Boys, there's this guy on there who eats cheeseburgers all the time. A big fat guy who never wears a shirt. Randy. Scotty was Randy. And I remember this because he always had these, he always used to joke around. He's like, yeah, but you know, I'm a little fat, but my arms are big though. And he did just like a bicep flex. And then my buddy would be like, yeah, your arms are fat too, dude. <laughs> but um, so he, you walked into his house. I went to his house one day. He had a big wall of me. Every commendation, his basic training certificate, the time he shook hands with the governor general, it's all hanging on a wall on a big wall of me. Medals and commendations. We all have the same stuff. I know, and then, yeah, I'm putting it in a little shadow box here, but it's a little, you know, ostentatious thing in the corner. I'm talking like the entire wall was filled. Just to show you how noble it is. And he always talked about, you know, military guys needed to be treated with more respect and we're a noble profession and this, that, and the other thing. Talked a lot of shit about how great he was being a sailor. Now, I distinctly remember he used to get out of sails because he had shoulder problems. Uh, if you guys have been in the military, we used to call them NATO knee and rim pack back. MIR Rangers. Sick Bay Rangers. You guys, I'm sure you guys have heard the terms. Basically, guys that would use the medical system or the Padre sometimes talk about their wife left them. Like one guy used the Padre to get a sail. Now, oh, Matt, one of the mats from uh, the one with the fiance from my book, where he said that he broke his wife's vagina and so he had to stay home and he actually got out of a sale with that. It's... Sometimes you just got to shake your head. Anyways, um, all right, come on, buddy. Dog wants some attention. There you go. Here, make yourself comfortable. And here's the thing. So he would get out of these sales because of shoulder issues. But then when he got posted to the shore station, there was a guy there who was writing his evaluation to promote him. And he would go to baseball tournaments with him and help him win games and stuff like that. And so he ended up getting promoted off of this stuff. Like basically promoted being a bag of shit. But I very distinctly remember. And then I just kind of noticed the pattern. The most guys who talked about honor in the military and valor and nobility and this were always the biggest pieces of shit. And the laziest motherfuckers and the ones most likely to try and take credit for your work or backstab you. The guys who were good at their job, were motivated at their job, were willing to put in the work and actually did have that sense of like ethical responsibility about their career, they would either downplay it or actively mock the military. Like it's like a weird sense of like false modesty. And so I just noticed that. And then to this day, and I will say this, there's not many hard and fast rules I'll give you about men, but the more he talks about how great he is, the more you can see he's pretty much going to be a piece of shit. What that means, do what you want with it. Learn, hear me now, believe me later. Am I am I saying that those guys are, no, no, not saying that. I'm just saying I have a very good reason for being skeptical when somebody appeals to my honor and my nobility and my kindness and all this shit. And I would much rather somebody appeals to my best interest because at least then I know he's aware that I want something out of an arrangement. And that's kind of why I like the rule zero guys. Like, Whatever. I know John's controversial. I know Myron's controversial. And Rich, take him or leave him. Rolo, love him or hate him. Troy, yes, no. Carl. Actually, I think everybody likes Carl. Me, I have no idea if there's haters or not. I usually mute them. They just help my engagement, so I don't mind them. But yeah, all of those guys, like, 
not a single one of us has ever told the other one to help us out out of altruism. It's always been, I got a plan. We can both do well on this. Let's do it together. And I'm like, it's, that's pretty much the way things have to work. And I would argue if you, and this is just as applicable in this goofy, nerdy corner of the internet as it would be to your job or your business, or maybe you have a Minecraft Let's Play channel and you want to collab with people there, make your own like Hermitcraft or whatever. <laughs> the Blue Falcons of the military. <laughs> Bull rush. Um, yeah, just getting, if you want people to work together, align people's self-interest. And that's why it's so hard to do because most guys don't know how to do that. They only know how to take. Give me it. It's mine. I want all the followers. Give me all the money. And I don't want to put it much work in it. I want to do as little as possible. But yeah, that synergy thing. And that's the thing. Like I said, rule zero. I like that. It's just, even though it's just a little goofy podcast of us talking about a show, it's not particularly deep as a concept. It's not particularly, you know, well-researched. And a lot of it is like, you know, smack talking and on brand as much as it is on point but everybody kind of benefits from it the audience benefits from that they get to learn about people like you know oh i didn't know who apex mindset was until this i didn't know myron or john and i used to watch rich's content but then i got introduced to rollos and that was cool or hey i didn't know about this troy Fran but you know what i mean like and so everybody kind of wins from it and i'd argue with your same thing i had to and i was in corporate i had so we lost our project manager for our security team we had a project where we were able to start what they call an identity and access management solution. Not going to bore you with the details of that. If you guys know what that is, great. If not, don't worry about it. The point is we had to get something to meet a regulatory, uh, a regulatory compliance standard. We were actually setting the standard. So uh, we had to move this project through. The problem is that to everybody else, this was just seen as another level of work to do. And since we didn't have a project manager, I had to pick up the rule myself. No idea what a project manager did. I'm like, okay, they just organize things. I can handle that. And all I did was just anytime I went to anybody for a meeting where I required resources from them, I either did the heavy lifting from our team. And it's like, here, all this stuff is done. We just need your sign off. Or if I needed somebody from their team, I either worded it or arranged it in such a way that it would make their job easier. I need some resources for this amount of time to do this project. By the end of it, you're going to be able to take these things off your plate. And I always appealed to their best interest. And it was amazing. Like having meetings with C-suite and they're signing off on things. I had like so many sponsors for my stuff at the end of it. And all I had to do was anytime I wanted something done, show how it's in somebody else's best interest to do that. Which is, I would argue, the opposite of the original topic of the show. That gullibility is uh, insecurity. Now I'm secure about it. I know there's this thing here. I know it has to get done. I know there's benefits for everybody. And without that insecurity, and they don't have insecurity, it's just a job to them. Their job's going to be fine. If or not, I'm not there. Nobody has this fear of missing out and all this stuff. And then you just focus on a solution. And then you make sure the solution aligns with other people's motives. And I'd argue for most guys that get screwed over by other guys is because they forget that. And then they appeal to that innate sense of nobility. Like, that's why... Chicks saying a real man would do this is such a such a per perverse way of incentivizing a guy. And I'd argue as soon as you start hearing somebody appeal to you like that, first thing you should do, tell them to go fuck themselves in as kind a way as possible. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. I can't remember the number. <laughs> dog spelled backwards is God. Yeah, we don't deserve dogs. <laughs> They're too good for us. Where'd he go? Oh, I was sleeping under my feet. Anyways, he ran off to go do his thing. And that's and that's the benefit of this. So once you don't have that crippling insecurity anymore, that existential insecurity in your life, you're going to see people try these manipulative tricks and you're going to see right through them in general. Oh, okay. That's good. Oh, yeah. As, as a real man, I should do this. Well, I guess I'm not a real man or just, oh, okay. Yeah, maybe. That's always the best answer ever. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I can see your point. And that was always the joke when Carl and I would talk about how, like, Rolo red-pilled us to women. So we're red-pilling him to men. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, good luck with that, sir. <laughs> Just call them your friend. Thanks, friend. Or bitch to be dark triad. Yeah. That kind of stuff always makes me laugh. Anyways, I'm going to go back to this because I love my dogs. So, yes, dog spelled backward is God. 
That's what I like about dogs, though. They're not manipulative at all. Although I'm starting to think they are more cunning than you give them credit for. All right, small dog story, then we'll get back on topic. Yesterday, we had to go out. I don't know what we were doing. I don't remember. Anyways, I had to run some errands or something like that. The dogs had some chew toys earlier. The girl doesn't like to leave them out because she knows that they occasionally get protective and start fight over it. And at least if we're here, we can break them up. But one dog was like finished his toy really or his chew toy really early or his chewy. She's like, I'm pretty sure he's hidden. It's, it's like hidden somewhere around the house because he always bats it around. Sometimes probably loses it. But like, all right, whatever. It'll turn up when it turns up. The instant we left the house, he went to wherever his hiding spot was, found it and had started chewing on it on the bed. <laughs> classic Corey. so we had to come home because we forgot something so we went down the elevator back up the elevator came in and we saw we went into the bedroom and we see the one dog's like just standing there and the second one is like in his face intimidating him i don't know how else to describe it other than like standing over him as if he's like trying to chew him out and then we see it brought the bone out so i'm like i don't know man i don't think dogs are as non-manipulative and honest as people give him credit for because he knew if we're leaving the house, we take away their chewies. So he knew to hide the chewy. He knew the instant we left was when he could go get it. Because he was just lying down sleeping before. He didn't even try for it. But as soon as we left, he grabbed it and did it. I was like... I'm starting to think gods and dogs are pretty manipulative. Oh yeah, they're very intelligent. That's the problem. Even my dumb dogs are still pretty intelligent. <laughs> By the way, this is a uh, this is a, a Manosphere inside joke. There's a guy, uh, Thorn, something, Ivan Thorn. And he always talks about being like a ninja and a vampire and a Viking and all this shit. But he's like deaf. So it's always like, how sneaky can you be when you can't hear the enemy coming up on you? It's a bit tasteless, but whatever. I always get a chuckle out of it. He pinched me once on my arm so damn hard it left a mark. I was like, why would you do that? That hurt. He goes, yeah, a real man wouldn't feel pain. I'm like, a real man doesn't pinch another man. Give me that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've heard that German shepherds, but they're very like the sh all shepherds are like the smartest dogs. Border collies, shepherds, sighthounds not so much. They just have really good prey drive. So the fact that they're outsmarting us like this is kind of kind of lets me know maybe I'm maybe I'm room temperature IQ. All right, so back to topic. So that's that's the manosphere drama. It's always weird. I don't, and I guess to speak about it directly, I don't trust people's motives. Like, I find it hard to believe that the last three years has been filled with so much smack talking that all of a sudden, like, the cry to be to be together and have unity is born out of any type of, like, remorse. I could be wrong. <laughs> I, li I would actually like to be proven wrong. I'm usually not, though. At the same time, expecting me or expecting all of us to work well with everybody else just because it's like, nah, man, when somebody shows you who they are, just trust them. And it shouldn't be it shouldn't be your job to convince the other person that you're willing to play nice, like a <laughs> dark triad mumble. <laughs> yeah. But luckily enough, like I said, I'm small enough as a brand that nobody's asking me to do shit. So once I get to a hundred thousand followers, then I can worry about this. Oh, here's the big question, by the way. I'm streaming it. It's gonna be here today. It's gonna be awesome. This channel, don't forget to subscribe and like. It's going to be fun. That one's based on, uh, it was an argument that John and I had once, like a couple months ago. I don't remember what the episode was, but we were talking about how for game, he didn't like any of the nonsense. He just like, how fast can I go from swiping right to having her at my place? And me, I was like, I, that would take all the fun out of it for me. I like the process. I like the idea of learning it, like learning social charisma and sexual escalation as like a skill set so i can always be better at it and even if i get shot down it's fine if i succeed even better but i always become better at what i do over time and so like is it better to focus on the process or the goal and there's no real clear answer here so i'm going to be curious we're going to talk about it like from business and pick up and all different perspectives like the one question i got for rich is rich when it comes to business is like it doesn't make money good enough don't care and i'm like well obviously i'm doing mine where i like to uh improve my skill you'll see like i want to become a better editor better at cinematography better writer and then getting better at those things and then the business part coming afterwards and he goes yeah but like my book just outsold yours so it's like which one is better but then on the flip side of the coin there's a lot of guys you find like a cash cow i think like the tates are one they did that cam girl thing 
made a killing off of it did great for themselves the problem is now with like only fans and the democratization of cam whoring i can't imagine their business is sustainable over the long term i have no idea what it's like now maybe it's doing worse maybe it's doing better who knows but but if all they did was just focus on that and make as much money as possible and not build up skills to like adapt when things change is that so great money short term versus sustainability long term so yeah there's no there's no clear answers so it'll be kind of interesting to see where guys take this yeah you decrease your options well and that's the thing like how many options do you need right that's that's the other point of it like yeah if you can swipe a girl twice twice a week on tinder get her back to your place have sex do you need any more than that no do you want any more than that well, i mean you could but you don't have to but then what happens if Tinder goes offline after a while? You're like, all right, I'll just use Bumble. What happens if online dating is gone after a while? But then that's where always like, that's a tomorrow problem. I'll deal with that. This problem today, I've got sorted out. So I'm just going to ride as long as I can. So like I said, there's no, there's no, there's no solid answer. So I think it's going to be a fun little conversation. It's open invite. I don't even know who's going to be showing up. So it could be the entire, like John Fitch might be there. Paul might be there, whatever. Uh, let's get back to this topic, though. I don't want to spend four hours talking about the same topic. I'll get super bored on it. Let's get into let's get into comfy mode. Everybody relax. If you guys haven't done it yet, lie back, finish your coffee. This is so cold by now, man. It's absolutely ridiculous. So the insecurity and gullibility. Um, I added the extra L in there for love, <laughs> in gullibility, or guileability, if you technically want to read it all autistic like. Because I find guys who fall in love tend to be the most gullible because they're the most insecure about losing that love. And I can't remember where I saw this one either, but somebody had talked about when guys talk about love, they essentially go through the same physiological changes as a heroin addict. I think it's an overabundance of serotonin. Or was it dopamine? I don't remember which. Point is, yeah, hormones kick in, the withdrawals kick in. Considering some guys kill themselves when they uh, when they lose the love of their life, I'd argue that the withdrawal symptoms can be equally as bad. I just lean back too. See, I am the nine. It's because you're smart people. But you're you're running a business now. You don't got time for all that beta male stuff. You're too busy running things. Um. Yeah. So when guys fall in love, and I'm. I know this is going to be like a very George, like a Bill Clinton way of saying like, well, what is is. What is love? And I'd argue love is just... And then people will throw all kinds of adjectives. But oh, no, I'm talking about that deep love. Whenever you kind of like whittle it down to its nuts and bolts, somebody will always argue, no, man, it's not that at all. And then they'll use some like more adjectives to add more obfuscation to it. It's like they almost don't want to know how it's made. And so I'd argue that when most people talk about love, they talk about it in the same way that a child talks about dinosaurs. I just discovered this thing. It's super cool and I feel really great. And as soon as I start articulating it, it's going to lose its magic. So I never want to articulate it. If you ever want to find a way to bypass somebody's frontal lobe to attack their limbic brain directly, that's exactly how you do it, dude. I'd almost argue that losing that childhood whimsical loving nature is kind of part of growing up. Like, talk to a 50-year-old guy about love and butterflies in your stomach. He's probably going to look at you like you have three fucking heads. And I don't blame him. He goes, yeah, I know what love is. Love is sex three times a week, a girl that cooks. Absolutely pleasant to be around. But it's sure as hell nothing like a butterfly in my stomach. Get out of here. But kids love talking about that. They eat that up. Like, what's the Joji? You guys know who Joji is? He's like, uh, he used to be Filthy Frank. An old YouTube guy did like gross stuff along with like iDubs and a couple of those guys. But um, yeah, what's he doing now? He's singing. He's singing love song ballads. The twenty, the nineteen and twenty year olds are eating that shit up. It's catchy, but yeah. Ooh, fun fact on this one too. So he's talking about. I had a post on the red pill. Every now and then I'll throw something up there if I'm in the mood and I can't really get out of my writing funk in the book. That was a post called Nobody Knows What the Fuck They're Doing. I don't know. I saw it because, again, somebody else sent me another thing. So there's this guy from the sphere who's just as bad as Anthony Johnson. Daniel something or other. You know, Gay Lou Boyle, he calls himself. But basically, he's just... 
he'll do something and then he'll go and post about how everybody should be doing it because it's the most awesome thing. And it reminds me so much of Trad. Like, you know, the guys that I just got married last year. Marriage is the greatest thing ever. It's like, give it a couple years, man, before you start preaching me on the Amway products. I mean, there's not much to it. Like I said, it's a very simple piece. It's just that life is changing now. Like, there are changes in life. The idea of being a YouTube content creator to your dad's generation is unheard of. They're like, what? You go on the internet and just ramble and people pay you for that? And like, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Just work in the mill. And his grandfather was like, you're not a farmer. How do you eat? When that's the point. So everybody who would normally have wisdom who's older than you either isn't in your life to offer it or doesn't have the understanding of, like, the modern world to be able to give you any advice. So people that are older than you don't have a clue how to adapt. People younger than you don't have a clue because they haven't done anything and they have no experience to rely on. So all you're getting is like old people telling you what used to work that doesn't work and young people telling you what they're doing, but you have no idea if it's going to work at all. Like Stedman's advice basically is going to land him in prison and he's still doubling down on it because he hasn't gone to prison yet. But then what'll happen? He, do you think he's going to go back on his word once he goes to jail and pound me in the ass federal prison? No, he's going to come out and saying he's a better man. And forget all that stuff he's been telling guys to do. And then just go back to tell him to do something new. Well, today I just figured out how to survive a divorce. So you can too. Leave your wife. Marriage is wrong. To... Fuck, there's a lot of value here. Guys, it's almost worth reading the chat as opposed to listening to me run my goddamn mouth. Yeah. I don't like the phrase put in the work is the only thing here with Dodo's here. Because it's such a vague term, it's very easy for people to make a fungible definition of it. But I get what you're saying. Like, we kind of agree. And Thomas is a great idea. It's like, passion for guys is weird. So everybody, like, follow your passion. Do what makes you feel good. And it's like, guys are kind of performance-based esteem. We are what we do. If you get good at something, you'll learn to like what you're good at. Our egos are very helpful that way. Chesty probably wanted to be, I don't know, an astronaut when he was a kid. And then he grew up and became a pretty goddamn good lawyer. Now he finds law to be fucking rewarding. Why? Because he's good at it. Same with me. I thought writers were stupid. Then I became a writer and now I find writing to be rewarding. Turns out when you do something, you start to like it more. And if you do something that's valuable to other people, you can earn a living from it. And that's how you end up with those jobs you like. Yeah. See, that's kind of funny too. Bunch of Twitch streamers actually making a good living, own property, parents wondering when they're going to get a real job. Yeah, it's just... And we don't know. Tomorrow, online gaming might like bottom out, might become like E.T. in the 1980s video game generation where it just kills the market, but who knows? But that was kind of what inspired it. When uh, So Galu, what does he do? He's moving to like Chile or something like that. Moving to, he's doing the Roosh thing. Move to a third world country because the West is dying and everything's better here. And he's like, he's been there six months and he's telling everybody you have to do it. Get in there, go do it. It's like, that's kind of not really what a field report is. A field report isn't about being the Pied Piper and that you have the perfect roadmap to a great life. There's a reason that I didn't really start talking about pickup to anybody until I had been out of the game for like 10 years. Because I have, you kind of need that time in between when you've done something and when you can reflect on the ultimate results of something. So now I can confidently say, yeah, you can do pickup in your 20s and early 30s and nobody cares. And you'll be you'll be just well adjusted. If you're well adjusted before you start it, you'll be well adjusted after. If you're a retard before, you're going to be a retard who learned pickup. That's the only difference. But I couldn't say that in situ like And that's why I remember pushing back up against Myron. He's like the game has totally changed. Girls are flaking now. Girls will sleep with a lot of people. And it's like, dude, we're like in the 2000s. Do you think it was any different? The only difference was they'd flake by not answering your voicemail <laughs> as opposed to now where they just don't swipe you. People. And as much as I've said, the landscape has changed. And yeah, it has like for a lot of things. But for some things like human interaction or sexual dynamics, we're probably living the exact same dynamics that uh, sustenance farmers in Poland in the 1500s are doing. Only difference now is that it's amplified because there's more people and our communities are way more spread out because we have easier communications. It's basically it. So sure, you can make a bunch of small mistakes because in your town of 500 people, 
you had a lot of like leeway or lag time between things, but now in like an instant generation, it just means you have to be sharper, just have to be better. But I mean, at the same time, you could say the same thing for work as the farmer, as long as you got the crops finished within a week of when you should start them, you'll be fine. But now in the information age, sometimes if you don't get that piece out within 30 minutes, it's done or five minutes, it's done. Like what are the information grifters like the, the Candace Owens and that do? If uh, something makes the news and they don't have a video out on it within like four hours, they basically miss their window and they're losing out on all the prime views of guys who are curious about it. So that's all we're missing is the lag time. And dude, some people are old enough here to remember the Cold War, so they should be used to this. The Cold War made the argument that you needed to connect. There was two, there was two systems when it came to like the military. There was the Marshall side, like force projection. And then there was the rebuilding side, all the logistics surrounding it. And during the Cold War, because nukes were such an existential threat, you had to have those two connected within, within six minutes of each other. And then once the, the Cold War ended, we kind of had to separate that. That's why you have things like the Iraq War right now. Force projection was the easy part. Very good at it. But that rebuilding of Iraq thing, not letting ISIS and Al-Qaeda move in, that was the tricky part the logistics side needed. And you can't put the military in charge of that side of things. It needs to be a separate organization. It's a great speech by Thomas Barnett about the uh, the Pentagon's new strategy for this. Essentially, if you break it, you bought it. Yeah, if a girl in the 90s owned a beeper, she used drugs. Nowadays, if a girl has a membership card to the weed store, she uses drugs. The only difference. And Thomas here, most people want to believe the lies they're told, though, and never really wake up from them. Fuck them. I don't care about them. I don't need them. I don't need 100,000 subscribers of which 90,000 people just watch me because they want to yell at me for being wrong about their pet cause. It's like, I don't need that hassle in my life. The extra money I would just spend on the alcohol on dealing with them anyway. Like, no. Don't worry about trying to convert people. People don't want to be converted. They don't want to be saved. People actively want to sabotage their life because then they can blame somebody else for the failure. And that's modern society in 2020 for you in a nutshell. Nobody wants to win. Like American conservatives, there was always that joke rocking around that they don't want to win. They just want to lose. They just want to be defeated nobly. And that's exactly what it is. Nobody wants to win. Because if you win, you're responsible for something. If you win, it's all on you. If you win, then the odds are, if it ever fails, it's only on you and you become a failure of an existential crisis. Nobody wants to, to know that for sure. It's much better to say, well, I would have won if they didn't cheat. Well, I would have won if the Clintons didn't murder that guy. Well, I would have won if. I would have won. I would have won if she didn't want to sleep with Chad. I would have won if she didn't have Tinder. And it's always just like, there's always some excuse that said you would have won if the world was fair, but it's not. So it's not your fault. You feel great. It's like, fuck you, buddy. If you can't tell that's a coping strategy, burn. Go burn. Go learn it the hard way. And again, this is one thing. It's the one thing that I'll say the trads get right is that when you were so busy being a sustenance farmer, you didn't have time to do stupid shit like this because you were too busy not starving to death. Well, I would have got the crops on time if if the forest, if, if like the almanac wasn't cheating. Like, no, you can't do that because if you do that, it's like, oh, by the way, winter's coming. In three months, you're not going to be able to eat. And you just lost three kids to this, <laughs> starvation. Congratulations, sir. But hey, not your fault. That's not how it plays out at all. Dude, I'm glad to see you caught on to it. I like it. Oh, I'm probably going to do a third edition of it in this sometime. I don't know how exactly that works, but I'd like to go back and revisit and see if I can add or elaborate on some of the things on there. It'd be kind of neat. But yeah, self-delusion, man. Nobody's ever lied to. People lie to ourselves and then other people accommodate the lie for their own interests. And that's all it is. Uh, my buddy called me last week trying to convince me how family life is so good and I should stop chasing the better life. Maybe he's jealous. Hope he's okay. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I don't know your buddy, but my instinct, if somebody starts telling me stuff like that, is to think something's up and what now they need is reassurance that they made a good decision. I actually have a friend who does stuff like this. And usually most of the time, like the conversation, I instantly just take it to talking about how great his family sounds and how good they are and all that stuff. And 
then he'll sometimes complain about something or other and you just listen to it. Yeah, a lot of times just guys want to pat on the head, tell them they're okay. And that's fine. What can I say? If you want to be a real man, then sometimes what you have to do is be be the oak. And sometimes the value that you offer to other people that they see as valuable in you is just emotional stability, which is such a low bar to manhood. I don't freak out and have a temper tantrum at the drop of a hat. Oh, wow. Please throw eight babies into me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oregon Trail, the home game. Except for instead of hunting buffalo, you're buying furniture. Instead of dying of uh, dysentery, you're dying of loneliness. Renting a van, going out the old-fashioned way. Yeah, maybe it's quarantine too. That's a good point. Because, I mean, quarantine's getting to us all. My girl and I are at the point now where we're just over it. I actually slipped up a bit. Like, usually when I'm out in public, I don't get as vocal about COVID the way I do here. And there was a buddy of ours. We always hang out at the dog park all the time. He's got an awesome dog. And I remember I just let it slip. Like, you know what? At this point, I'd rather just deal with the virus. And he goes, oh, no, man, don't do that. That's dangerous. Just wait for the virus. I'm like, oh, damn it. <laughs> Broke my own one damn rule. I, don't know, I guess COVID's getting to me where I'm starting to be like flat out honest about stuff to people that I'm casually acquainted with. Gotta remember, man. Law 38. Believe what you want. Act like everybody else. Oh, yeah. The virus sounds pretty bad. Well, you know, I'll catch you later. I haven't seen you smile in a year because I haven't seen you without a mask on, but that's okay. You know, as long as we save a life, right? <laughs> uh... Got to push back on easy trips here where be the oak is blue pill conditioning. If you guys, first off, if you guys don't know what an oak is, a great example, I can't remember who wrote it, Source Amnesia now, I have to go back to my research on it, but the idea was a lot of guys don't know what value they offer in a relationship, so they think it's, oh, I have a good job and I'm good with kids. But one thing that's great is that the more feminine a girl is, the more emotionally sporadic she is. And so for her sake... Somebody who is an anchor against that, like somebody who's very stable, doesn't get riled up unless they have to, like, you know, as long as you don't cross his boundaries, he's very level-headed, that kind of thing is seen as nice. The more emotional and feminine a girl is, the more non-reactive you are and aloof you are and charming about it, the better off you're going to be. And then a lot of guys don't understand, but that's like a huge benefit from a relationship side. And yeah, it's a beta quality. It's not blue pill conditioning, but it is a beta trait. Which is good for comfort. And if you want to have a relationship, you're going to have some level of comfort. Not saying you should do that all the time. But just having that there and knowing how to use it as a thing. So uh, it was the choice between be the rock, be the rock or be the oak. The idea of a rock is that nothing affects you. It just bounces off of you. You don't react to it. You don't feel it. Girls complain. Oh, it's just like you're just like you're talking to a like talking to a brick. I don't get anything from you. It's like you're not even here. Be in the moment. Blah blah blah. All those complaints. The idea of the oak is just if there's a windstorm coming, yeah, the oak you can see it move, but it doesn't. It stays put. It's not moving. Like it's not gonna uproot. But unlike the rock, you can actually see like it's aware that things are affecting it in the outside world, and that's where it's kind of like a good way of describing the purpose of tools like fogging, agree and amplify, amuse mastery more so. The ability to understand that a girl's going to have emotions, that they're going to have feelings, that they're going to want comfort, that they're going to want shit tests to be passed, that sort of thing. To understand all this stuff and to be able to just take it, but in a way that's, and this is going to sound like it's pretty bad, but emotionally engaged way of dealing with it, as opposed to being autistic. It's like, yeah, I get why you're mad. I just don't care. As opposed to, why are you mad? Do you see what I mean there? So I'd say it's not blue pill conditioning. The idea of blue pill conditioning is that it's that's the only thing you offer in a relationship. And that you become very boring and very stale. And your job and your good fatherhood is the only thing that you do. That would be blue pill conditioning. But they sometimes forget, yeah, it's sometimes being like an arrogant, aloof asshole, charming, pre-selection, all that other stuff to add to it. And between those two things, you become more than just like a one-dimensional archetype of soon-to-be-divorced weekend dad and pool boy. You know what I mean? And Dino, and here, I should preface this too, because I, I keep running into this problem, and I keep forgetting to add this don't-eat-paint warning. When I talk about this stuff, like this isn't, 
a plate that you've had for two weeks you're doing this with. I'm not saying do this with a girl you just met off of Tinder and then how do I be the oak on this first date? It's like, no, she didn't fucking earn that. Like I, I did describe it as something valuable that you add to the male-female dynamic. It's valuable. Women can't do it as well. And it's seen as like a goddamn superpower. But like everything, you have to value your own skills. So if you don't put any value on this and you're just giving, you're being the oak to every girl who walks by, you're no different than a girl who puts out on the first date with everybody who asks. Just, you're just like a man whore. But yeah, for plates, if they start giving this stuff and they need comfort tests at three weeks in, it's like, yeah, no. <laughs> Demote her to plate or just soft next to her and be done with it. But yeah, if you get at a point where over, you know, a sustained period of time, I'm talking like over a year, maybe you have kids together, maybe you have real estate together, some kind of investment past just we bump uglies once or twice a week. That's not so easy to walk away from and a girl has earned her place there. Then of course, these kind of rewards are absolutely wonderful and they're great at keeping a relationship going. But at the same time, you can't just give it to everybody. If somebody hasn't earned that, they're going to they're not going to value it. And this is where you get all these guys that end up simping. Yeah, they may be emotional and the oak and all this shit, but you gave it away so early. It's like, I don't get it. I blew him behind a dumpster. Why isn't he marrying me? That's what it sounds like to female ears. You know what I mean? Um, and on Bahani, Bahamani. Oh, like the rice. I know it's Basmati. Thank you for the hundred tornado dollars. I don't know what that reference is, but abundance and progression in technology breeds deviations from monogamy and meritocracy it was inevitable am i correct i don't think there ever was this meritocracy and monogamy you talked about i really don't i just think it was people didn't have a way of sharing information and the fact that we just have such larger numbers now it's easy to see like when there was one billion people on earth or like let's just say like a million people in the americas America, you'd have to have, if there was a one in a million chance of something happen, it would happen once in a lifetime. America's 350 million people now. Something that's a one in a million chance of happening happens, it could happen every day for a year. Or, you know, in your lifetime, you're going to see 350 examples of it. And you know what I mean here? Because of the way communication works is that everything is amplified, including these horrible events. And when we talk about you know, the divorce rape stuff or how bad men are treated and the fatherhood thing. I don't know if it is. Now, I don't know if we can know, but I don't know if it is a worse problem than it used to be or about the same as what it used to be. It's hard to say. Everybody makes the argument that things are getting worse, but I notice the guys make the best arguments about things are getting worse are the ones that have the least experience to remember what it used to be like. That's why it's always 20 guys saying, 20-year-olds telling you, oh, dude, the dating market is fucked now. It's like, how would you know? You were you were 10 years old not so long ago. You have no idea what the dating market was like. I'll listen to a 50-year-old guy who's who's divorced and single, spent like a 20-year gap between his 20s and his 40s. I'll listen to his take on the sexual marketplace. And for most of those guys who have asked are like, it's about the same. Um, a lot more girls shave, thank God for that. So that's that's like the big sexual advance right now is that girls don't <laughs> girls don't leave the landing strip. And that blowjobs are more frequent, but. But here's the thing. Here's like the overarching question. So you're talking like you have a theory here about how the past is, is based on the future, like this stuff. What does this matter? Abundance and progression technology deviation from monogamy. Let's say it does or it doesn't. What changes? Does anything change? If so, I'd argue it's that kind of mental masturbation that doesn't do you any good. And I know I'm saying this because I just been basically mentally masturbating with you guys for like two hours now, but I'm a hypocrite. Go with it. Deviations from monogamy and meritocracy, as opposed to like, so it used to be one way and now it's another way, which is maybe true, maybe not, but it doesn't matter. Focus on right now. Again, a lot of guys love talking about dark triad. The big part about the psychopathy part of Dark Triad is present time uh, temporal thinking. You think in the moment, you think today, you see what's right here in front of you and you act on that. You don't worry about tomorrow, you don't worry about yesterday. Worrying about tomorrow creates anxiety. Worrying about yesterday gets like this kind of mental masturbation stuff. So a better way of wording this is, you know, a lot of people aren't monogamous. Meritocracy isn't a huge thing in 2020. That would be a better statement. 
to go down like a red pill lens on. But we got to fill 20 more minutes here, so we'll 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 chase down a little rabbit hole. And then for uh, Ayani Kara, is getting married worth it? Again, I would argue no. It's actually every six months, there's always some idiot that'll come into the married red pill and say, uh, if I could do it again, I would. And then it starts this big fight over, do you get married? Do you not? And I think the problem is the way it's framed, the way people discuss it. For what it's worth, my personal stake is I'm in Canada, they have a thing called common law marriage. So I'm not married. I'm not going to get married. I don't think my brother is either. But if you cohabitate for a certain length of time, you become common law married. So it's similar, but uh, dissolving the relationship isn't quite as bad as it would be if you got a full on marriage. But I mean, with a girl, we live together, we're together forever, lobsters, all that good stuff. So like fundamentally, it just means the government doesn't get a stake in my relationship status. And so it's something we have to agree to. I think it's better, but whatever, it's not the point. Do you get married? Again, why? Instead of taking it as like the de fact, the default point, and then asking why not, take the default point as where you are now and then why. And that's the question I always ask. What is it that you get from a long-term relationship? And what is it you get above and beyond that in a marriage as a man? And I never really get good answers there. I think the best answer I ever got was wine more please, where he'd mentioned if you're working as like a diplomat in a different country or your girl is uh, from a different country, a lot of the times she won't be able to get citizenship or you won't be able to get the benefits in that country. Like if you as a diplomat in Dubai, if you're not married, they're not going to care. They are like common law, whatever. You guys are just going to jail. <laughs> so that would be an edge case. But here's the thing, though. Nobody, no manosphere talking head is going to tell you about your most important life decision. And if you listen to it, it's your own stupid fault. It's not my job to tell you if getting married is worth it. I can show you. I don't think it's a good idea. And I can explain a bunch of legal ways why. Uh, legally, why it's a bad idea. Uh, emotionally, why it's bad. Girls have that extra security that they didn't otherwise have. And I'd argue it's a bridge too far. Keeps the attraction down. Um, the pomp and circus stats around it. The economics around that. But it's like doing a listicle. Nobody's going to make this decision based on a list of advice. They're just not. They're going to base it on emotional ones. If your parents had a horrible divorce, you're probably not going to be a big fan of marriage. If your parents are still together after 40 years, you're probably going to say marriage is the greatest thing ever. So it's like arguing about being circumcised. Whoever, you can tell who's been cut or not by how they argue whether circumcision is mutilation or not. And most MRAs just use it as a gotcha moment to show we're just as, just as wronged as feminists who had some like Ethiopian tribe hack at a girl's lips with like a cut apart rock. Um, ooh, permanent residence for three years. So that's what, it, but that's the thing. Here's why I hate talking about what you should do or what you must do or setting you up with an ideology or a worldview or all that shit. It's not my job to tell you this. It's the girl's job. Like, do I settle down with this girl? It's like, I could tell you, yes, I could tell you, no, I can make like a top 10 ways to know if you're alpha and the girl's really into you as a hypergamous best option. Number seven will surprise you, but nobody's going to give a shit about that. It's her job to show you that it's worth getting into a relationship with her. And if the girl's not fighting tooth and nail to keep you loyal to her, then why are you giving her commitment? That's like saying, dude, the guy didn't even take you out to dinner. Why would you sleep with him? Well, he was cute. Well, yeah, that's great. But that's why she's pumped and dumped. And now she's in her 30s with a nest full of cats and a box of wine in the back, you know? But then most people just say kids. As soon as they say kids, oh, well, marriage then. You have to have kids because apparently apparently your sperm doesn't work until there's a certificate. Well, yeah, but without the ring, she won't do it. Well, like, you can buy a ring. Rings aren't hard to buy. I bought a ring. Give a guy money. They give you a ring. You give it to the person. You tell them this is this is, means everything or whatever. Or what did uh, Patrice O'Neill call it? The whatever you want it to mean ring. I thought that was kind of clever. But that's the point. That's why I try not to give you guys hard and fast advice often. Like I said, I don't like saying should unless I have to. Not many things are should in life. They're always if. That listicle. It is a funny sounding word, isn't it, Tommy? 
But yeah. Well, why would you want to marry her? What do you get out of a relationship you don't get out of marriage? And I'd argue the only thing, and I see like, what is that? Female dating strategy, a little bit of like Tumblr girl, trad Twitter types. They always talk about girlfriend, um, what they call it? Girlfriend benefits and wife benefits. And that don't give girlfriend benefits. If the guy doesn't want to buy the cow for free if he gets the milk. Like, you know those things, that kind of shit. No, don't move in with your man until you're married. Sounds great. Don't uh, don't sleep with your man until you want to get married. It's like, that's great. I'm assuming you haven't slept with anybody else either. So if you want to go with the abstinence route, power to you. But teenage pregnancy would have a would like to have a word with how effective that's going to be over the long term. As much as girls try to use their sexuality as like a power pivot point and like, I don't want to say blackmail, but they're essentially like the carrot and the stick. I'll give you all the sex. You have to give me the commitment. And I'd argue like Rolos, uh, what was his one iron rule? Any girl that makes you wait is by definition not worth it. It's just the modern world, man. Girls give it away so easy right now. It's that you can't use your sexuality to secure commitment anymore. Because it's been devalued to the point of a commodity. It's like, what was it? John, Carl, Troy, they all say some of their fastest times are like 15 minutes from texting a girl to sleeping with her. And they've never met her before. 15 minutes. Like prostitutes take 20 minutes to track down and call. You know what I mean? Like that's how that's how cheap sex is right now. So I'd argue it doesn't work. So what does a girl do above and beyond that? And I think that's the key. And I always like joking around that uh, a girl should learn how to cook. You'll keep a man. And then to which, you know, every girl with short hair in her 40s calls me an asshole, which is fair enough. Fair enough. I did hit you in your sensitive spot. It's only it's only fair you get to call me names. Tell me about your dad not liking your mom enough or whatever. But what do you do other than sex to keep your man loyal? And it's not my place to tell you that. It's her place. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a whole other set of issues, too. He's talking about the Catholic girl thing where it's like they'll do anal so that way they can still keep their virginity for their husband. But then that's the problem. The husband finds out, wait, you used to do anal all the time and now you refuse to do anything except for normal sex. She goes, yeah, it's specialer though. He's like, fuck that. It is. <laughs> you gave a guy anal after knowing him for 20 minutes. And then with me, I had to work with you for three months, buy you 17 dinners to get just like a little bit of missionary sex where you looked away and closed your eyes because the Jesus candle was on the windowsill. Fuck you. Yeah. And here's the thing. So this is to make the point here. So we got 10 minutes, so we're going to end this off, and then we're just going to shoot the shit for the last 10. Feminism, I'd argue it's not really a thing, but whatever. Women's nature ultimately benefits the alpha side of the equation and the sexual strategy, even a denial and delusion that can't stop from submitting. Yeah, I mean, that's essentially it. The 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 working horse beta male blue pill style way of doing things just is not fundamentally useful in 2020. And so adopting the alternative as a strategy is going to be better. Alpha fucks, beta bucks insofar as a girl deserves it. It's so far, it's worked out well. It's gotten me through the last, you know, 11 years now. I think 11, either 11 or 12. I'm not sure. This summer is our anniversary. I remember the date. But here, we'll get to it. So our future MD, $10 super chat. Thank you very much, sir. If none of your plates have LTR potential, do you dump all of them and start from scratch or rotate a new plate in? Thanks. Stuck in Texas listings to the sidebar in a loop. Oh, you poor bastard. I hope you have power. I mean, I'm assuming you have power. But if you're using the last 10% of your phone's energy here to super chat me, I appreciate it. Um, I should leave this up while I answer this one. So yeah, why would you dump them? You're getting what you want. Guys generally want sex. As much sex with as much different people as possible. We can make all the moral arguments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just fundamentally. If she's giving you the commitment level that you're comfortable with, with the value that she provides, and if it's just sex, then yeah. If all she does is sex and somewhat pleasant to hang around, plate. If she wants more than that, she has to be more than that. If none of them have the potential, which by potential, I just mean investment. If they're not investing, don't invest. I don't know why you would ditch them though. Like, why would you dump them, start from scratch? Let's go talk to girls. Keep a rotation going. It's not like, now here. I'll, I'll, I'll caveat this. Let's say you're super Chad, Chad Almighty. You got your double booked to smash seven days a week. You got 14 girls on rotation. Every day you're bringing home one girl in the morning, one girl in the evening. And in that case, not a single one of them shows they want anything more than to sleep with you. They don't want any relationships. They don't want nothing. 
half of them are married, the other half of them just don't like men, and you piss off her dad, so she's like, yeah, I'll take you. I could argue in that case. Yeah, maybe cutting them cutting them loose. All right, I'll see you every three weeks for a Smash session. It frees up some more time to meet other girls, and maybe one of those girls is invested and wanted to keep you around and show that she's better than the other 14. But 99.9% .9 of guys are not going to have this problem, and I don't even think it's worth doing those hypotheticals. I actually had a big rant yesterday. Not yesterday, the day before. Oh, look at that. Chesty crushing it. Um... It's always the same thing. So I'll mention some story that's come through a bunch of field reports or my own experience and then the lesson to take from it. And then somebody will always bring up a hypothetical example. Well, what happens if X, Y, and Z happens then? And I'm like, here, I don't like hypotheticals when it comes to sexual dynamics for two reasons. One, either you don't have any experience that you can draw on to ask this question, in which case this isn't for you. You're not there yet. If you've never had something happen to you, why would you speculate on it? The other one is, excuse me. <coughs> oh, I hope I have the limiter set. Okay, good. At least I didn't kill your ears. The other side of things is if you do have experience on something or somebody who has experience that you can draw from, then you don't need the hypothetical anyway. Just bring up the actual scenario. And so bringing up a hypothetical scenario, I just find it's like useless masturbation and it'll always... It creates garbage, garbage in, garbage out. Like I said, none of your plates, all of your plates have LTR potential. Unless you're dating like 20 crazy chicks. Every girl, if she wants to invest in a guy, can probably get him to commit to her. Be hot, cook for him, clean his place, you know, stroke his ego, all that shit. If a girl wants to do that, she can do that. And 90% of the time, she will hook the guy. So I don't agree with the first premise that None of the LTR, none of the girls have long-term potential. They just don't want to have the potential. It's like what they call a uh, a competitive monopoly. So restaurants. In other words, when you're in a restaurant, they have the entire power of what you can or not buy from them. You can only eat the stuff that's on this menu, but you can pick to eat at any restaurant you want. And that's a competitive monopoly. They can set their own prices and you may only be able to get a McDonald's cheeseburger at McDonald's. And they could charge $100 for it if you want. And even though they have a complete monopoly on the McDonald's menu, you can just go to Burger King and get a Whopper. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not that, but it's interchangeable. But yeah. But I find for the most part, like, since the dawn of time, girls don't have a strategy going into this thing. They just follow their feelings. If they get a guy that's a lot of fun they like hanging around with, they'll settle down with him just kind of naturally over time because... As they start falling for one guy, they start seeing other guys as less attractive and they start drifting off. That's why you'll notice if one of your plates ever gets hooked up with a in a relationship, wants to get married or have kids or whatever, all of a sudden all of her old like orbiter Facebook friends have fallen off. She just stops following them all on social media because they just she just finds it all less attractive. Anyways, um, so that's gonna be it for this one. Hope you guys enjoyed yourself again. Don't forget. Gullibility has a second L for love. And the insecurity makes you gullible. So just don't. Yeah. Kind of want... Well, that's the thing. Kind of. You're talking about like a, a, a at least an 18-year commitment. I don't think kind of is a good enough incentive. Don't be one of those guys that buys a puppy and then three months later has it up on Kijiji trying to sell a puppy. You know what I mean? But that's the thing. It's not my job to convince you either. If a girl really wants you enough that she wants to make a life around you like that, she will make best effort to convince you that it's in your best interest to keep with her. And if they're not, then whatever. You got tons of time. You're 35. Dude, you could be 55 and still sling it. So don't forget, like, subscribe. I don't have an ending for this one. I'm going to let you guys go. Don't forget, same channel, half an hour, rule zero, process or uh, process of the goals. I don't fucking know. Preferences are preferences. Anyways, guys, I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers.